Southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth. Scent of magnolias, sweet and fresh. Then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here's the fruit for the crowns to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the sun to rot, for the trees to drop. Here's a strange and bitter crop. Tonight's episode of Black Progen is going to be much different than many of the others that you've seen. We've done 82 other episodes, but tonight is markedly different. Why? Because in 2018, the Equal Justice Initiative opened the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which memorializes more than 4,400 African-American men, women, and children who were hanged, burned alive, shot, drowned, and beaten to death by white mobs between 1877 and 1850. Our team here at Black Progen Live spent more than two months researching the families of more than 50 people lynched in 12 states, and tonight's episode will feature the family history of some of the victims documented in the memorial in an effort to humanize and bring light to their lives outside of the tragic event they have been associated with. Nothing of this caliber, absolutely nothing of this caliber has been done in the genealogy world, especially on this topic and on this scale. And it is the first of its kind. Thank you so much for joining us for Stories from the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, part one. As the conversation takes place, we definitely want to hear from you. There's a lot that we're going to be sharing tonight. So if you have a question or a comment, be sure that you join the conversation. You can participate in the live chat taking place on YouTube at the top right hand of the screen if you're watching on a computer and at the bottom of the YouTube app on your mobile device. Also, you can weigh in on Twitter by tweeting us at BlackProGen or use the hashtag BlackProGen. Also, if you this is the first time that you're joining us and you want to be sure that you join us more often, you can be sure to subscribe to the channel, um, which is Who is Nika Smith. And by doing so, each time we go live, you will be given a reminder that says, hey, they're, they're going live or that a new video has been posted. Also, you can set reminder under the episodes that you're interested in that are coming up to be aired. All right. Tonight is going to be a very heavy episode. So before we even get started really, really well tonight, I want to remind everybody that they need to be mindful of what your body is telling you. Some of the conversations, some of the things we're going to talk about tonight are going to be super tough and they're going to be things that um, maybe it's hard to hear, it's hard to process, or maybe things that it may take you a little while to kind of you know, leave it, leave it where it is. And if that's the case, that means that you need to practice some self-care. Luckily, we do have an episode that we aired um, some time ago about self-care for researchers. Um, it was really good and detailed. It talked about how each time we find new information, whether it's something as severe as a lynching or something else in our family history that is emotional, we subject ourselves to traumas every single time we do that. And we have to be sure that we practice self-care. So feel free, please, to look at that episode, view that episode um, after you watch this one, um, light your candles, you know, if you partake in alcohol, drink, get a drink, <laughs> um, maybe talk to someone, um, decompress, do whatever you need to do to make sure that you are fine and that you are not emotionally disturbed by what we'll talk about tonight. Now, I will tell you, we're not going to get into 
the super duper details of um, the cases that we're going to be covering because that stuff is freely available online. What we're going to focus on is the humanity and the legacy of the victims that we're going to be talking about tonight. The fact that they have families, that they have people who are still living to this day that still suffer from the trauma of the experience that their family went through as their, as their ancestor or their family member was taken from them. Um, and just as you are imagining this and you're feeling this yourself, because I feel the heaviness of this episode. Um, in fact, um, I want the panelists to come off of mute right now because I want all of them to weigh in before we we actually really get into the um, the the everything. Um, we need to talk about our experience doing this research. Um, just so you all know, I think every single one of us has had a technological issue that happened today. It was a challenge for us to even get to you on this screen. That's how that's how powerful what we're going to talk about is in whatever realm you consider, whether you are Christian or not. There, this is this is a spiritual experience, um, and so you know if it was from people getting a black screen trying to join, my computer completely failing, and the power not shutting on today. What I know is that we were meant to share this information and it was meant to get out and it was meant to get out through us. And so um, I want to give the panelists um, some time before we really get started to um, what 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 are you all feeling at this point? Because we've been working on this since January behind the scenes. No one really knew until we announced it maybe about three or four weeks ago. How are you all feeling now that we have gotten to the show? Don't all rush. I'll start. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, this is necessary. Uh, last week I said the most patriotic Americans have always been people of color and, and, and who fought for a country that didn't stand up for them and who forced this country to live up to the creed. You know, this, this, there's all levels of trauma here uh, for me, the silencing of communities. Uh, you know, I sit there and I think of my own personal family history as a descendant of someone who was lynched in a different context, but it's the same. And, and I feel strongly that um, it is our duty, the descendants of, of those who are, are still here to tell our stories, the good, the bad, the ugly, to, to rewrite and resurrect these lives and these stellar family histories that we have and we've uncovered. It is a moral obligation, a moral imperative to us to write our ancestor stories back into the historic record and tell the truth. We are their voices in this life. I would support what um, Teresa just said in terms of uh, the task. Of I think I would the, say that um, I- uh, Carmen, Carmen, you're, uh, you're interrupting Angela. Just, just oh, wait sorry. for a It's okay, <laughs> it's go okay. ahead, go ahead, Angela. Yeah. That's okay. No, I, I would certainly agree with what uh, Teresa said. I think that we are bringing more to the story. As one of my favorite writers, um, um, some of you may be familiar with her, Chimamanda uh, Adichie points out that there is the danger of the myth of the single story. And yes, tragedies that happen, that is one incident that certainly traumatic incident, but that is not the only story. That is a singularly tragic story, but it's not the only story. And so what we've done, I think, with this project is to give more to that family, to the descendants, to the nation, to those who suffered just hearing about it, more of the story because just as our story does not begin with enslavement, that is the single story that lasted about 300 years, but that's not the only story. And we must go beyond that and find the rest of it. And that's what we've done. Carmen? No, okay, okay. Ellen, would you like to chime in? Um, yeah, I just, feel really privileged to work on this. And it's uh, it's really necessary because uh, what I got was this kind of like horrible feeling of this, just this go round of the same kind of violence over time and the same kind of 
thing. And, and, and some of it is so, uh, what's really perverse about it, uh, when I look at the roots of it, it ultimately rests upon declaring people to be not human to be objects, to be sold, to be, to, you know, to be done with whatever somebody had wished. And um, I don't think enough people really realize the cost that people had just to speak to what happened to their families. Uh, one thing that became very, very real was that, you know, you speak, you die. That was a lot of how they tried to control the narrative in the South. And, uh, and, and in a lot of places, and, and I also have to say, living in Florida changed a lot of landscape for me. I mean, I knew this kind of thing was going on, but like, it's, it's just something that people really need to know. This country, it's a really sick country. It needs to heal. And this is one way we can help with that. Alex? I I want to piggyback off of Ellen. This is what we're doing on this show is more than, um, you know, ask Mariah and looking at census records and death certificates. We are healing. And I think that as each of us on this panel prepare to, um, to share what we've researched in the last two months, um, I really just think that we also have to remember that it is, in the words of Asada Shakur, it is our duty to fight for our freedom our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other and we have nothing to lose but our chains. This is the first time um, in all of these genealogy spaces that anyone's ever specifically taken time to honor not just um, the slaves or not just the immigrants, but we're honoring people that were very specific, brutal form of hatred that persisted well into the 80s. Um, and while, while we're covering um few of those we are honoring each of them and i really really appreciate the work that each and every last one of you guys on this panel have done and if there's any contribution that i have to give to this show is that i'm in utter disbelief and thanks for all of you guys for what um you guys are doing with this work thank you true anything you like to say before we kind of go into uh some brief stuff before we jump into the cases tonight just humble, just humble that we're able to speak their names and that we're in this position to do that and to honor them. Um, it's been kind of somber around here, um, but I'm just glad that we have the opportunity and we've had so much um, input from all the panelists and they have really worked hard on this. And I'm just humbled to be here, to, do, to, be, to be in your presence presenting this. So that's, that's all I have. Carmen, anything you want to add before we move on? Um, I think I would just say, I would apologize off front because I can't hear people. So if I interrupt, it is not on purpose. My apologies. But um, I did just want to say that I, I feel like um, this process started um, seemingly like forever ago, but also it seems like yesterday. Like it just seems like the time has passed so far or so fast. And, um, but one thing that I can say is I was fortunate enough in my project to um, uh, make contact with the descendant of the person that I was researching. And um, I have learned that this is like super real trauma that people are still dealing with like generations later. But it also became important to me. And if someone already said this, my bad, but um, my story is actually has a very positive component to it. And it just reminded me that these are humans and that some of them come from really amazing, rich histories. And I would like to see that be highlighted with them just as much as the tragedy of their passing. I think that the positivity, there, there were beautiful things in their life. And I would like, I, I'm so happy that this was a project where we, some of us will get to really share some really beautiful things that happened with their ancestors and in their own personal history. So um, I do like that part, part of it. So. Yeah, that you actually brought up a really great point, and no, you did not say anything. <laughs> someone else did, um, but that is so true. That I, you know, when we decided to do this show last year, you know, it could have just been about the memorial, right? That would have been the easy thing to do, 
would have been to just focus on the memorial, how it was built, when it was built, how much money. I mean, we we really we could still even do a show about that. But but Black Pro Gen Live, the bread and butter of Black Pro Gen Live, the specialness of Black Pro Gen Live, the distinct, unique part of Black Pro Gen is the skill level and the expertise that everyone that is a part of this has. And to me, I felt like we would be remiss if we did not put that to work to unearth the stories of these folks outside of what they, what they're, they just think about footprints, right? Footprints are so important right now online. Cookie crumbs are so important online. Why? Think about how people apply for jobs and if they have a negative social imprint, they don't get jobs. Just imagine if every time someone Googled your family's last name, information about the murder of your ancestors popped up. That's what happens with these families. And unless a reporter comes back later, because, you know, that's, that's what we found a lot of, where reporters circle back to the families because of the memorial opening last year and seeing what they were doing, you know, all that kind of stuff happens. But just imagine every time you put that name in, right? Imagine if when you started your family history research and the only name you had, you put it in and you found out that person was brutally murdered or that they were lynched. That that's a lot. And I wanted to make sure that we could leave something positive behind. There were instances, which is, as, as Carmen said, where we reached out to descendants, we found descendants, or they found us. And then there are instances where some of these families, they don't have a single soul left because they were all decimated as, as a result of what happened. So if, if, if what we're doing is just a gesture of goodwill, then let it be that. But if it's more, I want it to be more as well. So before we get in super good, um, let's talk about the definition of lynching. What is lynching? What is it? Because someone, someone watching may not even know exactly what it is. You know, I, I guess I'll start off by saying it's terrorism. It's in some ways it's legally mandated terrorism because members of the, the, uh, structures that govern us have been involved in in this legal form mm -hmm. of terrorism mm -hmm. um what what would you all add to the definition of what lynching is extrajudicial murder there's no there's no court there's no people just decide a group of people just decide to to annihilate someone basically and uh there's no cost to it and 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 uh it, it, it maintains a social submission. That's the purpose of it, you know, through fear, intimidation, violence, torture. And a very bizarre, I'm a sorry, very, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. A very bizarre part of that is that it became a community event. You mm -hmm. see the postcards, little children looking up at the burning body, smiling. Some of these children, are in their 80s and 90s in nursing homes now. But they were children who witnessed those, mm -hmm. who were able to live their lives, although the victim who was swinging from the tree didn't. And these were events. People took pictures, made postcards. And hey, you know, you see the backs of the postcards. This is how we handle troublemakers. Ha, ha, ha. Wish you were mm -hmm. here. Right. This is the sadness about it. It's just as, I think, Nika, you had found something about, we were talking about the discussion on blackface uh, a few weeks ago, and you found several hundred yearbooks with references to pickaninnies and folks in blackface. This is a sad, sick piece of entertainment for the American culture. We are the victims, but we're also we're still the target. It's terrorism that was celebrated in the communities, terrorism that went unaddressed, that is still unaddressed. And um, as we are on the eve of perhaps the one execution of a lynching, a uh, man is about to ex be executed for the murder of Mr. Bird a few years ago, um, supposedly tomorrow. But does that really heal us? Because there was more to his story too, and his family, and they've got to move beyond that. Alex? So 
it, oh, whew, that just that just kicked me in the gut. I also want to add on top of that that when we think of lynchings, I think that we often think of the hanging body from a tree. I think that we also think of this the public spectacle, um, as you guys stated before. But I think that lynching also can be can be the form of any sort of violence that takes life in front of many people. What do we have going on today? Come on, um, Alan. Where, come you know, on, come on. I'm sorry, you preaching. Keep going. You know, I you know I love the feedback, but honestly, the 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 visual brutality that we are witnessing online every day is not by coincidence that it's happening right now in this generation. This is state sanctioned. They want to reinforce fear, and they want it to re to be reinforced on a broad amount of people. And that's what's happening. Um, so lynching, to go back to your question, Nika, lynching can be the form of a hanging. It can be the form of a shooting. It can be the form of a beating, but it definitely happens and it is continuing to persist. So I'll leave with that. I, I, I want to add something here and, and, and what everybody, whatever anyone else has said is true. But it's also the historic silencing of our voices, our lives, our minds, the community. It's, 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 it's basically rendering us silent and so that our voices cannot be heard. You know, you, you silence the body, you silence the voice. You silence the body, you silence the community through what Ellen said, fear and intimidation. Um, and and which, which I'll beat my bandwagon we need to be the voices. They can't silence us. It ain't over until we sing and shout. We have the ability, like we're doing tonight, to resurrect these ancestral stories. These people were somebody. They, they, they cannot be seen just as victims. We, we, we need to pass this information on so that their descendants, we, we came from, we were a people. We always have been. It's, it's our basic humanity and it's our moral imperative as descendants to tell the stories. And it's not up to any other allies to do this. This is our, this is what we owe our ancestors. It's our moral imperative. It's our charge. It is our charge. And I, I, if I can't drill that, I have to drill it into people's heads. This is our moral duty as descendants to resurrect not only these yeah. The, the individual families, but the communities. Just, just. This is a, this is very important work, and this is the work all of us should be doing as we move forward. Is becoming the voice of our ancestors in this lifetime. I don't want to get to the hereafter. And someone said, "Raisa, you didn't say anything." You know, we gave you. We didn't just leave you. You know, your 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 eye color, your lips. We left you with a lot of other stuff to be a truth teller. To, 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 to tell people that they too can persevere. We need to be their voices and no one can tell it like we can. And I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, and I, I, yeah, you preached a sermon. Um, I, usually we would say it's decision time, but it can't be for this episode because we have a lot more content we need to get to um, just to be able to share with you all. And so before, just briefly, before we really get into the content, we need to talk about how throughout time we didn't just lay down and, and just take it. That's something that I, I really feel that folks need to understand. This is, this is a page out of a book that was put together by the NAACP in 1919. And it is a map where they tracked lynchings across the United mm. States. Okay, so a hundred years ago, they, I mean, United States. Um, let's okay. see who who. I'm sorry, someone has something going on. I need that to to stop. But this is something that's just been. It's been. We we didn't take we didn't sit down and take it. Do you see all the black there at the bottom? Mm -hmm. All the black there at the bottom. That means that that those th those those were hotbeds of where this was taking place. So if the NAACP was bold enough to do this a hundred years ago. 
to call out these states and say, look, you have a problem. And not only did they do this, but when you go further into the book, which is available on the Internet Archive, they list out the actual names of the victims. Right. And now here's the thing. There's not a single state on here that's white. Mm -hmm. Let me point that out. There's not a single state on here that doesn't have a figure. You all not a single one. In fact, look at Wyoming. Were lynchings supposed to be happening there? But they were. So mm. that that this is just, I want to put this before you because we, we've got to acknowledge the work that was done by previous people, like the NAACP, like the, you know, the Equal Justice Initiative, which put together the memorial. In fact, you know, I have a friend that lives in Montgomery and she told me that Brian Stevenson bought the land from the memorial and sat on it for years because he knew that if the community knew what he was doing, they would find every avenue to get it not to happen. And he was intent on it being in Montgomery and it being exactly where it is. And do you know that there's a Confederate museum right down the street from this? Do you know that the Rosa Parks Museum is right down the street from this? There is no coincidence. We have to acknowledge work like Northeastern University School of Law and, and their civil rights um, and restorative justice work that they do. And the fact that they've been tracking lynchings and, and, and terrorism in the black community and in and, and any community really, right? Look into these sources, look into what they're doing. Equal Justice Initiative puts, has an amazing lynching report. We'll share the link in the chat so you guys can read it. Because this is just as, just as the census or a draft card is a part of our history, this is too. Just as slavery and trying to trace your enslaved answers, ancestors is a part of, a part of your history, this is too. Because even if your ancestor was not lynched themselves, someone in their community probably was. And that affects people emotionally, mentally, physically. Maybe your ancestors are like Shelly Murphy's, where they left where they were in Indiana and moved to Michigan because they saw someone being lynched. So just as you look for color in other ways, you have to also factor this stuff in too. And with that, I'm going to get into the first case for this, this evening. And this one is a doozy. Um, I, there's no other way I, I can even articulate it, y'all. I, I just, I just, yeah, no other way. All right. Just take your time. Dr. David Augustine Elihu Johnston was a dentist and inventor who resided in Helena, Arkansas. Dr. Lewis Harrison Johnston was a physician in Coweta, Oklahoma. Alan Gibson Johnston was a car dealer in Helena. Corporal Leroy A. Johnston was a World War I veteran who was wounded in France in 1918 and denied a Purple Heart until Dr. Brian Mitchell, a professor at the University of Arkansas Little Rock, sought and secured what was due to him just last year. Late on September 30th, 1919, sharecroppers gathered at a church in Elaine, Arkansas to discuss their displeasure about the low wages they were receiving. They reached out to well-known white, well white attorney from Little Rock, Ulysses Bratton, who came to Elaine to lobby for a fair share of the profits for the sharecroppers. At around 11 p.m. that night, a local group of white men, some who were affiliated with law enforcement, fired shots into the church. The sharecroppers fired back. Notice, you all, there's a running theme through a lot of these that people didn't just lay down and take this. And one man was killed. Word spread quickly and rumors arose that the sharecroppers who had formerly joined a union known as Progressive Farmers and Household Union of America were leading an organized coup against the white residents of Phillips County, Arkansas. Arkansas Governor Charles Baugh made a call for 500 soldiers to subdue the group of, quote, heavily armed Negroes, end quote. There were orders to, quote, shoot and kill any Negro who refused to surrender immediately. At the same time, the Johnston brothers, who I just 
told you about, the, they're all four of these men come from the exact same family. They are brothers. We're returning from a squirrel hunting trip just outside Elaine, Arkansas. According to Dr. Brian Mitchell's research, the brothers got on a train to Helena and the train was stopped by a group of angry whites. The group handcuffed the Johnston brothers, put them in the back of the car handcuffed and took them away, despite the fact that they had nothing to do with the incident at the church. Oral history states that the brothers were all, were all in the car of a well-known politician and business owner, and that one of the brothers grabbed a gun and shot and killed the driver. The, the angered group of whites then killed the brothers in retaliation. Their bodies were dumped on the side of the road, and they were allegedly horribly mutilated. Oral history from Dr. Mitchell states that their mother had to pay a bounty to get her son's bodies back. By the end of it all, more than 200 African-Americans were killed in the Elaine Massacre of 1919, which celebrates its 100th anniversary this September. The Johnston family lost four of their own in one night. Now, in addition to the brutality of all of this, this particular case is it just reinforces that there's no amount of education. There's no amount of social status. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of know-how that one can have to escape this level of brutality. So all of those, those things that people like to throw out when, when different things happen when we see an Alton Sterling or or if Orlando Castile, if they just would have, if they just would have, no, here you have four if they just would have for no damn reason. And I'm sorry I'm cussing, but it pisses me off. And it didn't matter. Not at all. So what do we know about the Johnston? True, can you mute yourself, please? Yes. What we know about the Johnsons is that Lewis Harrison, David, Allen, and Leroy were sons of Reverend Lewis Johnston and his wife, Mercy Ann Taborn. In 1886, Reverend Lewis Johnston and his wife established the Richard Allen Institute, one of the first Presbyterian schools for African-Americans in the state of Arkansas. That's what these men came from. Mercy, their mother, was born free in Granville County, North Carolina. Reverend Lewis and Mercy were married on March 2nd, 1870 in Union County, Ohio, while they were both in college. Their parents were college educated. And you saw, right, that, 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 that all of these boys were not, they weren't slackers. They came from a very well-known and very well-to-do family. Mercy and Reverend Lewis would later, uh, they later moved to Jefferson County, Arkansas, where they had seven children. You're seeing right now the 1900 census with Reverend Lewis listed as a minister. Mercy is listed as an educator. Their son, Lewis Harrison, also listed as an educator, along with their sons, David Leroy and Alan Gibson. And at the bottom of this slide, you see a picture of, of Reverend Lewis right there along with his wife, Mercy. Lewis Harrison, David, Alan Gibson, and Leroy were the sons of uh, the Harris, uh, Lewis Johnson and his wife, Mercy Ann Taborn. And here is a photo of the school that they started in Arkansas. We actually found it. This school was in existence until what the thirties, Angela, unmute yourself. So I can, I can get you cause your, your slide is next on this. Angela, you're still muted. There you go. Okay. She's still muted. Um, this Sorry, is, okay. that's okay. Yeah. So tell me where you found this photo. Um, this um, came from the Encyclopedia of Arkansas and also, it's in another text that's just eluding me right now. Um, it was just so deep in thought about the family. Um, this institute lasted, in fact, a lot of people don't realize that the Richard Allen Institute exists 
interested. When people think of Pine Bluff, Arkansas, which is where um, the school was, many people think of the school that existed at the time, which was Arkansas A, M, and N, Agricultural, Mechanical, and Normal. And many people will assume that, oh, this must have been the preparatory school that was part of uh, this historically black institution, but it is not. This was a private Presbyterian school that existed, and it was a boarding school that existed um, until the until 1930, what is also interesting, later I even was able to read a deposition uh, from one of the students who attended um, the school as well. And um, which um, it's just something that's, it's part of the history, part of the education history of not just the city, but Jefferson County, Arkansas as well. And yeah. the Johnstons yeah. created this. And they created this, you yes. all. That's the thing. These they, 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 they were free people of color. Both their parents were free people of color. Let that sink in. So this is not, these were not folks where they didn't know slavery for several generations in this family. So so keep that in mind as you hear us telling yes. these these stories. Um so moving forward, um, Angela, you alluded to the fact that there was a pension file and something yeah. else that we discovered was that Reverend Lewis Johnston was a Civil War veteran. He was a all. Civil War that veteran, that is correct. And um, thankfully there was a pension file on him and very, very, very amazing information. This is a man, in fact, um, in the regiment in which he served, he was in the 41st U.S. Colored Infantry. That is one of the many uh, infantries that were part of the Army of the Potomac that were also present at the surrender of Lee at Appomattox Courthouse. So this is a man who was, who was a free man, did not have to enlist, but did enlist and certainly was not just an eyewitness to history, but was a participant. This man who was free, who still fought for the freedom of his, of his brethren and witnessed history and had so much to live for. And one can see that he was a corporal, which typically if a, uh, uh, an enlisted man was promoted to corporal or sergeant that spoke to a degree of literacy that the soldier had, and he was promoted to corporal pretty early on as well. And you, uh, one of the things that we also located in this file was the fact that uh, once Reverend Lewis passed away and Mercy yes. was trying to secure his pension, they actually went to a former student yes. for yes. her to verify facts in the file. Right. So can you imagine, like, I'm just thinking of like Dr. Lowenthal, like, you know, needing to secure her husband's pension for something. And they came back and asked me questions. Correct. That's what happened. Well, at the time that he died, of course, um, there they had had several children, but there were two children who were under 16. And so, of course, she was hoping to be able to make sure that she got a widow's pension because she had to provide for these children. And so the question, of course, arose in terms of, well, who were these children and are they really, you know, a, of a certain age? What years of birth um, did they have? And one was very, very interesting because one of the witnesses, in fact, said, oh, yes, I remember when Leroy was born. That was the year I, I started. I entered the school that Mr. Johnston had started. And on, I know <clears throat> on a subsequent page, she even went on to say, oh, yes, I remember when when the next child was born, uh, because that was the year we got our dormitory and we moved into the dormitory of the school. And again, these are individuals whose lives were touched by them. And these people had such an incredibly um, just a rich life in terms of accomplishment. And which is why, of course, there's so much more to the Johnston story. And of course, he was a young man. Um, I don't know if you have that or not. Um, when, I think he was what, like 17? Yes, so? he was a young, young boy when he enlisted. He was living at the time in Pennsylvania. And 
And under the service um, card where the occupation was listed, and this was where I realized, because I hadn't studied other aspects of the family's history, but I realized, wait a minute, he must have been a free person because his occupation was not a farm laborer or farmer. His occupation at the age of 17 was a student. He was in school. Here was a young man was going to school in the 1860s. This is not after 1865. We're in the middle of the war. And he is now leaving school to enlist in the Union Army, suggesting, ah, he was free. He could attend a school. And again, which of course leads, well, the tenacious researcher to other aspects of that family's history. Absolutely. So we we already have a scenario where we've got a dentist, a doctor, we yes. got a car salesman, and a veteran of World War One who would eventually get a Purple Heart. Their father started one of the first schools for people of color in the state of Arkansas and was also a Civil War veteran who witnessed the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. And we're yes. not even done with this family yet, y'all. Yeah, we're not even done. We're not even close to done. So in addition to the Civil War service, sit in your seats now. What you're looking at right now is an affidavit dated August 13th, 1844 to obtain the Revolutionary War Pension for Burl Taborn, the three times great grandfather of the Johnston brothers. Burl Taborn was born about 1761 and died January 9th, 1842 in Nash County, North Carolina. Burl's son, Larkin, who was born about 1797, was the two times great grandfather of the Johnston brothers. Larkin and his siblings received his father's pension. Teresa, would you like to talk a little bit about the Johnstons and their free people of color ties and this tie to the Revolutionary War? You know, I, I, in, in research and uh, Nika had tasked me with research in the free people of color. I was amazed that they had so many, uh, USCT troops and, uh, uh, and then beyond what Angela found so many. And then I went, kept going back. Um, they were from, uh, uh, North Carolina and they were triracial. Um, we're not too sure which, uh, indigenous group, but probably Saponi. Um, but I was, I was just floored that again, multiple patriots. And I I'll say it a zillion times. There ain't no group of people more patriotic. And when you look at the, the, the totality of the Johnson history, you're, 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 again, you're looking at black patriots, extraordinaire families that no matter what, stood up and fought for this country to live up to the true meaning of, of the creed that we are all created equal. You know, you let the, let facts matter. Just let that sink in. Okay. You have people even today, like ain't no Ellis Island here. I'll say it a zillion times. These are the true patriots. And, and, and when you go back and you, and they're mentioned in Paul Haynes, uh, Haynes book, uh, you, you, there is a paper trail that leads right to them. Okay. So there's no ifs, ands, buts. It is what it is. They are true American patriots. Yeah. You have, you've got three separate generations of the same family where you have people who willingly enlisted and participated in battles on behalf of a country that in some way sanctioned their murder. Think about that. Because as I read the description of what happened to, to the Johnston brothers, I discussed how the governor of Arkansas sent in troops who were just kind of going in there doing whatever. And of course, with vigilantes in the community, these four men ended up dead. But they didn't they didn't come from nothing and they didn't have a legacy that was nothing either. So um, there there's 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 more. <laughs> Believe it or not, there is more for these Johnstons. They they are an absolutely incredible incredible family. So the last thing I'm going to share with them tonight, and you all feel free to ask questions, um, is the real, the will of Reverend Lewis Johnston. Um, and 
he's the will the, his will is both benevolent and what it provided to his family but also a clarion call to those of us living today he died in 1903 16 years before his four sons were murdered for no reason in his will he says there are quite a number of sermons and a few lectures i would like um, these to be arranged some are merely extracts of from sermons of others and used by me some are whole cloth the truth of these many are not worthy of passing but form the stepping stones of our people merging from slavery and it is only to help fill in one's place in onward progress he goes on further should i drop off suddenly i must leave behind me many uncertainties i've been accused of many things of which i'm innocent and i have borne it faithfully but i'm a sinner only saved by the grace by grace through jesus christ our lord and i am not worthy of any blessing he bestows upon me for i've done many things contrary to his will and for these i humbly crave his favor and pardoning his unworthy servant and pray his blessing on these my heirs and friends i have written this in haste for fear my fear might be realized and so far as i feel now i am willing to go at the call of my master my hope is in his word of promise given i trust in the lord did did he have a premonition about the fate of his four sons that's almost like that's almost like what his will reads was was someone after him what we do know is that there was no amount of being free no amount of education accolades or social status that would have saved his sons then or save them now despite this reverend lewis prayed and had faith that there would be better for them and for us we remember his words and we utter them for him today. Rest Amen. In peace. Rest in peace. Amen. All right. All okay, right. there's part, and I, I just want to add here because one thing that our ancestors left us with, and I'm trying not to cry, is our faith. Okay. When you walk with God, you, you fear nothing. Well, you kind of have to operate on that with this right i mean you you have to imagine him being this trailblazer where he was he was potentially constantly under the threat of of different things mm -hmm. you know and and thankfully in this scenario this family was not killed off there were two children that lived and that have descendants and it was their spirit just couldn't be killed off and not everybody was that lucky all right we're going to move on to della uh varner mcduffie which the research for that was led by ellen fernandez sacco okay um oh okay so this is the uh the death certificate for della varner mcduffie um she was uh an entrepreneur with her husband. She lived in Wilcox County, Alabama. And um, one of the things I tried to do was to try to pull what I could beyond the, the newspaper articles and to try to get a better context for, for understanding the family's life. Uh, one of the really galling things about this death certificate is that uh, it says that she died of a cerebral hemorrhage. It does not say blunt force trauma, which is how she was murdered, uh, according to witnesses who were there um, almost 66 years to the day in 1953 in Wilcox County when uh, Sheriff Lummy Jenkins and his deputy showed up at her, her small cafe, which was attached to her home that she ran with her husband and her son Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Varner. I'm sorry, I can't remember the middle, his middle initial. But anyway, the, he owned a small movie theater up the street from the um, from the cafe. So, like you know, when the movie went out, you went to the cafe afterwards. You hung out and whatever. It's a really small place. So, um, so the supposed crime that these the that they showed up was for playing music after midnight on the Sabbath. And, you know, so basically she was also disabled. She was in a wheelchair and the sheriff basically beat her to death with a rubber hose and uh, shot at her feet, told her to get up and all of this. But anyway, 
Um, I don't really want to get too much into it, but it's so, it's just, <laughs> it's hard, man. Anyway, there's a documentary, The Trouble I've Seen, that includes interviews with her family members, and they, they talk about what happened. Um, there's also, it was also made possible by the work of the, um, the, the, just a second, the, at Northeastern University, the, the National Center for, um, I'm sorry, Nika, I'm blanking okay. on the name it's of the okay. organization. It's okay. It's the Civil, uh, this is Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project at right. the Northeastern University. So a student there, Bayless Finman, worked on the, or worked on it, interviewed the family. And this was a case that when it happened, Thurgood Marshall, you know, they sent the FBI down. They, 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 well, Thurgood Marshall said this deserves to be investigated by the FBI. And, and then you start to notice that this is a recurring narrative in many modern stories of lynching where you send the FBI down, they go and interview people and nothing happens. We can't do anything because for whatever reason, and they just close the case after doing their investigation. So um, the film is really, if you haven't seen The Trouble I've Seen, it's, it's on YouTube, it's about, I think it's about 26 minutes, under half an hour, about 26 minutes, and it has three cold case files that have been worked on by the students, and um, Della, Mrs. Della Varner McDuffie's is the first that's discussed on that in that film, and they talk about it being a cover-up. So um, this is also why it puts, um, it puts the reliance on documentation into question when we look at that death certificate. You know, some people say, well, the buck stops here with a, with a birth certificate or death certificate or something, but there's more to the story. You know, if, if, if somebody just used that death certificate, they would never know what happened to her. You know, this was, this was a cover up. So um, beyond that. The official cause of death on the death certificate says cerebral hemorrhage. Right. Right, and the same due, thing. Yeah, due to due to high blood pressure. That's right. What, that's what the source. That's what the death said on the death certificate. And then, uh, you know, the the also the high cost of speaking the truth. You know, to try to get justice was also retaliatory. Her husband, William McDuffie, refused to take his story back, and a year later, his family had to find him stretched out across the. He had been murdered and stretched, drowned and stretched across the door, the doorway of their home, and left him there. You know, and the, his death certificate also says cerebral hemorrhage. So um, it's taken a long time for her story to kind of uh, to come out uh, because of the efforts by the by the program and the students at Northeastern. Uh, but that's not all of it, you know, that's not all of it. I mean, Wilcox County, I think one thing people know about Wilcox County, it's a home of G's Bend, you know. So we know that there's a lot of creativity, there's a lot of stuff, a lot that people did that, that, they were, that there's something there and it's not to be dismissed, you know. It's not to be, because they're living in poverty, that's not, you know, the, there's too many times that they're, um, that people are just regarded as disregarded and less than, and that continues to today. And that also really struck me too, was that today it's, um, they're dealing with a lot of waste, toxic waste in that area, because specifically because it's a rural uh, area living in poverty. But um, going back to her family, looking at her, um, looking at the family, it really goes back to trying to re going back to reconstruction and before. And one of the sources that I found really interesting to kind of understand what life was like then was William J. Edwards, 25 years in the black belt. And um, they will have the, uh, uh, the 25 years in black belt starts out with all I have learned of my ancestors has been told to me by my people. So you basically have an oral history for Wilcox County. I mean, it's, it's Edwards' history, but I think we can also see McDuffie's and Varner's histories in there as well, in terms of what people had to, what people did 
to survive and to nurture their own. So one of the things that happened was there was an industrial school built there and that made an opportunity for people to get out, you know, to, to actually leave an area like that. Um, McDuffie's family wasn't a family that left her. There's an uncle in her husband's family who was a, um, who was a graduate of the school whose photograph I found in the, in the book. And um, he actually made it out to North Carolina to become a principal living there. So it's not just that it's uh, this kind of limited thing of people who didn't have, didn't make any efforts to make changes in their lives. It's a tremendous amount of effort, a tremendous amount of suffering and, and uh, effort to just try to, to try to survive. But you know, I'm, I know there's another document that you wanted to show or? Yeah, think? I've oh. got the, uh, I've got the two that you sent over. Go ahead okay. and put that on for you. So like, um, it's go. really tiny, so I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, 1866 um, state. Okay. Census. So this is the other thing is sort of like it's after reconstruction. And what you start to see is people starting to make efforts to build their lives, to claim their identity, to claim their equality, you know, but you're still dealing with the state. So and, and in Alabama, they were not up for that. This, the, the people, the, the people running the state. So then you have something like the 1866 uh, colored census of Alabama, which shows a number of Varners, but then you don't know if they're living next to each other. You don't know, you know, you can tell from the numbers in the, in the room because it's a numeric census that there are several generations in there. Uh, some of these people I, I might be able to identify and have been able to kind of uh, piece out in terms of that community but it's really hard uh, with that census. But that's the first time we see Haig Varner, which is um, uh, Della, Mrs. Mrs. McDuffie's great grandfather. Is it great grandfather, second great grandfather? I think it's his great grandfather. His great grandfather. Generation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's great grandfather. Yeah, so we are able to go like at least three generations back. Yeah, now Alex, I just wanted to say, Alex points out it's a vital document for early Alabama research. Absolutely. True. Yeah. This is the uh, voters list from 1867. Right. And then one of the things that uh, Haig Varner does is, is registers for the vote. Uh, it's very interesting. You don't just register to vote. You are going because there's federal troops there making it possible for you to go in that courthouse, wherever it was that you were taking the oath to the country to, 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 to sign to become a voter, to, to declare you equality. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the, um, the hope that people had in reconstruction in uh, 18, you know, in this time period begins to be pulled back pretty quickly so that by 1885, people are actually disenfranchised again. But, uh, but there is this effort, man. there is this effort to, to, to you know, to be identified, to be to 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 show up, and and also in Wilcox County, there were several groups that served in the uh, USCT. I don't, I did not find evidence that um, the Varners or the McDuffies participated. I don't know, but I but you know people people did, uh, they did serve. And this is something that, you know, maybe some people would want to not know about or try to, or it, it's kind of a history that's just kind of disregarded, you know, and I, and I find a lot of this, this whole story is full of this like disregard from the beginning that people are constantly working against, you know. Well, and there's one other thing too, that through the process of you doing the research that you discovered um, that was actually kind of shocking to me, um, it's something that you covered in one of the two blog posts right. that you wrote to support um, her research. Um, that's something for, for everyone to kind of look out for is that those of us who have worked on this research, we will you know, most likely be sharing pieces of it um, through blogs or, or whatever, whatever you have. Um, to, to continue the conversation to keep it going. Um, and I, let me go ahead and put that screen up so you can, um, you can, everyone can see what you found that was really super shocking. Okay, so, you know, one of the things that we do as genealogists, right? Look for the newspapers, look for whatever got published. Okay, so I'm there looking for, I figured this is a big case. You know, they had so many 
there's a lot of, I figured there would be a lot of news coverage. So I put her name into newspapers.com. And um, to my shock, her name didn't even come up. Okay, I got an article, which was the New York Age. And in there, the headline, could you read the headline, Nika? <laughs> Did you have it? It's like, it says like FBI investigates murder of Alabama woman. So yeah. how specific, how specific does this have to get? They didn't index her name, you know? It just was just, I was just like, what is this? But then when I look for the sheriff, you know, the man allegedly responsible for doing her in, oh, you can find like his mention, his name mentioned twice in the article, a line above hers a line above hers. So I really have questions for newspaper.com. And I really would like to know why this is. What is this, an algorithm? What, like you couldn't spell Della? Like you couldn't smell McDuffie? Like there's white McDuffies in the newspaper.com results, you know? But this did not come up. And I was just, um, I was really shocked. I was really shocked. Yeah. At first, I thought it might be a glitch with Ellen's, something with her account. And when I looked for it myself, I had the exact same thing happen. And uh, you can't find her husband either. Yeah, you, you can't find either one of them, which then that, that then begs the question, what happens when descendants start looking for information, you all? And this is recent. This is not like she passed away. 150 years ago, you all. So well, I, I, I personally want to thank Ellen for bringing this out because, you know, the next thing we need to do is get in touch with newspapers.com. Oh, well, that's easy. Yep. And, <laughs> and, and it, well, you know, we, we again, we are their voices mm -hmm. and it takes all of us when we see this happening, because this is just one case. How many more? How many more out there? How many sins of admission, the continued silencing of our stories. We are the living. We need to take a stand. And, and, and she, I'm so happy that uh, Ellen has been on this. And, and a lot of us need to be on this. You know, this, this is critical. This is how we can't be vested in our continuing uh, silencing of our ancestral stories. We can't. We got a mouth. We need to use it. And there's only, everybody knows me, I'm Vegatron, only one way my mouth goes and that's up, <laughs> voice goes up. Well, but, but, but this is very interesting when it comes to just how things are, are, are documented and, and, and the ways in which our stories are, are, are you know, it could be in intentionally or unintentionally erased. Yeah, well, I will, I will also add, uh, you know, I have a really, a good friend of mine who is in tech is a tech lawyer. And one of the things she argues against a lot in that sector is when you don't employ a diverse group of people to program your products, you have situations like this one where TSA is saying, it's not us that has an issue with scanning black women in their hair. It's the machines. Right. So, in this scenario, what is it about her particular name? Because it's right there in text, it's printed, it's not like somebody was handwriting it. What made it so that it was not searchable? Mm -hmm. And could this be a, a larger issue? We don't know, we can't make an assumption that it's the system is racist, right? We don't know, but it's something that, that we have the wherewithal to be able to call out. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thank you so much, Ellen, for, um, so for sharing that. For sharing that. Anyone else have any feedback they want to add about the Johnstons or or Della before we move on? Anything that's burning that you want to say? I Alex? just want to want to come back to the to the algorithm piece, Ellen. I'm so glad that you pointed that out, and I think that uh, there's a really good conference called Data for Black Lives, and one of the things that um, that this conference specifically focuses on is this. Um, this tech age and this in this idea of data mining and so on and so forth and what we're using data for. Well, we um, found in the last few years that a lot of these algorithms, um, 
I can't think of the word, so excuse me, but they are not working for black people. In fact, they are harming um, black communities at a tremendous rate. So when it comes to um, researchers of color and descendants especially of all of these traumatic events, um, what is happening in, in all of these these companies, we have to think about the generations network that owns a majority of them. We have to think of newspapers. We have to think of even Genealogy Bank. When it comes to this um, and what's affecting us, there definitely is a large body of research out there that will tell us why Miss um, Della's name did not come up. It, it's there. It's there. It sounds sure. like sounds like a potential topic for another show. Um, you know, how 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 the erasure or potential erasure of people of color is manifested through the systems that we use and how we learn to work around that erasure. Um, and we may not even think of it as an erasure, right? I mean, it's, it's the same reason why my, we never had a dustpan at our house. We used record album covers. <laughs> you know, you just, you learn a way to work around it, right? But there shouldn't be a way for us to work around it. We shouldn't be working around it to begin with, so. Oh, and just just really quickly, the New York Age, that's, I believe, an African-American newspaper out of New York. It so is. they were the ones that covered it. I didn't find many other papers covering it. And the other interesting thing was the split when we we're reading and doing this research, the split literally along the collar line of, in the newspaper coverage, mm -hmm. you know? between what's going to happen between this kind of like, oh, there was this big event, you know, the, this, this, the, the gruesome murder, and then they'll cover that in the press and drop it or yes, whatever. Yes. And then in the black press, the, the, the cries for the call of justice and asking like, well, what are they going to do about this? Like mm -hmm. who's on this and who is working to get this story out? So, I mean, that's, an, that's like another level of, you know, that's that's something else I got to learn about doing working on this. Absolutely. That is that is very true. That was another another through line that, that we definitely yeah. saw. All right. Well, the last case that we're going to present um, this evening is one on uh, a young man named Mac Charles Parker on February 23rd, 1959. Mac Charles Parker was jailed for the rape of June Walters, a white woman who was two months pregnant at the time of the attack. Two days after his arrest, Parker was abducted by an angry white mob. He was brutally beaten, taken to Louisiana, and shot to death. Approximately 10 days after his abduction, his battered body was found in the Pearl River in Louisiana. This took place April 25th, 1959 is when they, uh, they found him. Um, actually should be February. It's an error on the slide. Now, the average person is probably looking at this thinking, okay, you've got Mac Charles Parker. He's born in 1936. What can you find on someone who is that young, right? This incident did not happen in 1872. It didn't happen in 1900. It didn't happen in 1925. This happened in 1959. He technically died in Louisiana, but he was abducted from a jail in Poplarville, Mississippi, which is in Pearl River County. Yes, people in the in the chat room are remarking he was a handsome young man. He was. <laughs> he totally was. But, you know, thinking in terms of genealogy, right? The average person is saying you probably only have one record that you can find him in, right? You can find him as a four-year-old on the 1940 census, and that's it. So of course, that's the first place you look. And I did locate him, but you know what? If I didn't have forethought or knowledge of knowing that his family actually referred to him as MC, I wouldn't have found him. And here he is listed in the 1940 census with his parents. Mac was the son of Peter Parker, a World War I veteran from the 806 Pioneer Infantry who had a deployment in France this is the second person, you all, in this episode that we have tied to a World War I veteran. Corporal Leroy Johnston was wounded in France. And here, Mac Parker's father also toured in France during World War I. Peter uh, was married uh, to Eliza. 
Peters. That was her maiden name. So she didn't change her initials when she got married, similar to me. Um, all were residents of Pearl River County, Mississippi, as evidenced by their enumeration on the 1940 census. Mac had three brothers and one sister at the time of his death. Two of his youngest brothers were only aged two and four when he died. What does that mean? That means that his siblings are still alive. That means that he has two brothers that never really even got a chance to know him because he was killed when they were children. So let's talk about what happened because unfortunately before Mac was killed, his father passed away. So his mother was a widow. She was a single parent and um, she had to endure this by herself. Eventually she fled the area. That's another through line that we all saw throughout doing this research is that who in the world in their right mind would stay in these communities after this brutality takes place? You wanna get the hell out of there. A lot of them fled North, but in this scenario, Mac's mother actually fled to California. She went to Modesto where she died only what, maybe I think it was 12 years ago, you all. His mother just passed away, just died. She fled there to her sister. She had a sister who was there. He came from a very large family, extended family. And um, yeah, the chat room is like, what? Get out. Yes, she went to California. In fact, um, one of the things that was very interesting for me to find in this case was that his mother was in the, was in the newspaper in Oakland because they fundraised for her and her surviving children in Oakland several times through different churches, all kinds of stuff. So let's get back to Mac though. When you have someone who was that young who passes away where you only have one census, you have to move to additional record sets. And one of those, because we are dealing with the state of Mississippi, are educable children's lists. And these are specific to the state of Mississippi. These are a census of school age children. And you see the one on the left, is for 1945, and you see a young MC or Mac Charles Parker, son of Peter Parker. Um, and then you also see the last one that he was enumerated in at age 20, where it's listed, his mother's listed as Liza Parker. I actually found Mac documented seven times in the educable children's list by the time he was 20 years old. Now, what does this do? This, is, this establishes that he's alive, he's living, he he's in a community you see other parkers listed on the page with him right family members so this is this is not a this is not a oh you know we can only find one census or one thing this is when you have to go to additional record sets so if you have family members that lived in mississippi you should be using if not there's a clue to use the educable children's list as a resource two years after max murder Three members of the New Orleans core chapter, or better known as the uh, Congress of Racial Equality, were jailed for integrating a bus station in Poplarville, which is where he was arrested and torn from his jail cell. One of them was Alice Thompson, a 21-year-old student. Following the arrest, they were placed in the same cell that Mac was ripped from in order to be lynched in Pearl River County, Mississippi. This is just two years later. Listen in as Alice recounts what happened there in November of 1961. Lodge, uh, Poplarville is uh, the place where the, uh, this is the guy that uh, was put in jail for allegedly doing something to a white woman. And they uh, took him out of the jail cell, killed, uh, beat him up, killed him, and threw him in the Pearl River. They put us in the same jail cell because we were integrating. Oh, well, we were testing. They put me in this jail cell. And the other male black prisoners, because uh, Pat and I were all, the only uh, female. Yeah, and one white person. And white, one white person. It was Pat, I, and Frank. While we were in jail, they weren't worried about Pat and I. They were worried about Frank, the white folks. They wanted to take Frank out and lynch him. And 
Betty Andrews, she must have done a good job contacting our attorneys in New Orleans because the white folks were gathering and they were having a meeting to come get Frank and take him out. The sheriff was in on it. And Frank was so scared. All of us were scared. So Niels um, uh, came very soon, the next day or something. And some kind of way they worked it out because we had to stay there for about three or four days. And then after that, for a week later, we had to come back for trial in Poplarville, Mississippi. The folks were so bad, our attorneys had um, tried cases before the Supreme Court of the United States. Mm -hmm. Our attorneys were nervous. Alice Thompson is my first cousin. And tonight, I have someone um, I would love to invite to the show who is going to talk about that experience being arrested and threatened with lynching in the exact same location that Mac Charles Parker was arrested in and stolen from and taken. And that's her sister. And her name is Jean Denton Thompson. She was a member of the New Orleans chapter of the Congress of Racial Equality. And she was there when her sister was arrested for integrating um, in Poplarville. So Jean, can yeah. you talk? <laughs> oh, you said Jean, so I was waiting for you to invite me to see Jean, please. <laughs> well, uh, I, what would you like to add to, to what you said? Um, I, I had to share that clip because that was someone who had to stay three nights in the same jail cell as someone who had been lynched, who was around her age. And just how cavalierly Alice talked about it when I interviewed her about it, um, just watching it, um, I, I did that interview with her 13 years ago and she was displaced from Hurricane Katrina um, while we were talking about it. And Alice passed away um, three, and, three and a half years ago this year. And um, I just can't even imagine. So <laughs> I gotta go to the questions, Gene. How, how did you all end up there? Like, why were you even there to begin with? We were on what we call, we then called testing to see if people were uh, obeying the uh, ICC, uh, uh, law where it's supposed to desegregate everything, uh, like uh, anything that was interstate, doing uh, dealing with commerce. And we started from New Orleans. We went to Mobile, Alabama. Uh, Mobile, and then you know, I think we went. Yeah, then came start coming back, and then we went to Hattiesburg, and that was one of the places that we were supposed to stay. I mean, get off and test everything. But some reason, something happened to the bus and we couldn't go on. And they were supposed to come on back to New Orleans after that. Uh, the, when we got to, we left Hattiesburg. Then we stopped at uh, Poplarville. There wasn't a, a planned stop. Everything that we did was supposed to have been planned. But we had contacts with the people uh, in each a little small town, and we didn't have any contacts there. Alice and Pat ne uh, Smith Nelson, they decided they were going to get out because they were what we were supposed to be doing. We were supposed to be testing, so let's go test this. And uh, Dorotha Smith and I and uh, Betty Daniels said no. This is not the plan, but they decided this is what we're going to do. The two women, they got off and they, they were gone for more than 10 minutes. And for us, something must have happened. Then Frank decided that he was going to get off the bus and, and go and see what happened to these two women. And he didn't come back in about 10 minutes. And that's when we decided something must have happened. They must be arrested or something. And we had a uh, sports person that was Betty Daniels. So she got off and then heard what happened after um, 
she got off the bus, but since she was a sports person, she was supposed to find out what was going on. But she found out that they were looking for her to arrest her. So she found a a um a telephone booth. People these days don't know what a telephone booth was, but it was a hideout for her. So she hid there until it, it got dark and she saw a black person pull, uh, passing by. So she said, psst, psst, psst. and this person just opened up the door and he said, I, I knew you were there. So he just took her to a, uh, a safe place, place. And when it got dark and they found out no one else was gonna come and get them, then he drove her to the uh, state line. He was going to let her stay there. And meanwhile, according to Betty Daniels, he was singing and praying, Lord, what shall I, sh shall I do? I cannot leave this child here. Guide me, Lord, please guide me. And he did guide her to where uh, the chairperson uh, was from our uh, chapter in New Orleans. And uh, her name was uh, Aretha uh, Castle. So it, he brought it there. And then we waited around for a whole week before they set the, uh, the trial. But when we got back, to Poplarville, the the uh, the uh, the courthouse was in the huge garage of the uh, the uh, the judge who happens to be the commissioner of uh, the fire department, the head of the fire department, and we stayed in there for about I don't know how long, but anyway. That was the only time in my life that I was part of the uh, civil rights movement where I was scared. And these people were talking about lynching us and they were really angry with Frank because he was white, Frank Nelson, he's no longer with us. And everybody was sort of crying, but me, uh -uh, I was not gonna let these white folks make me cry. My face was in a frozen, smile like this and the next thing i knew my sh my uh cheeks start shaking <laughs> but i was going to shed no no tears but alice i think you mentioned mentioned in that cliff that our lawyers i mean they were excellent lawyers they told them i don't think you folks want the fbi to come down here and get into all of your business and stuff like that because we are in contact with them. They are following us. And then they ask them, in order for you to practice law here, you have to have some uh, connection with uh, uh, some lawyer in the state. And there was only one or two black lawyers in the state of Mississippi at that time. And he said, yes, we were, they had affiliation with uh, Attorney Young, which wasn't the truth, <laughs> but they believed them. <laughs> And somehow we got out of that. But it's the only time that you can fear, feel fear because it was all up in your face. And you can see the people, how evil they looked. And I know they went to church every Sunday, but they were willing to, there she goes, they were willing to take our lives because only for what reason to exercise the freedom that our forefathers fought for. And I just have to say one thing, we as a people have never been shut out because the ancestors were out there with us all along. They're, they're with us now and they will, always be with us we as a people we're going to get our stuff may not be while we are alive i mean physically but honey let me tell you it's going to be a hallelujah we're going to be dancing away all of us going to be dancing because we're going to get it we may not not in my lifetime i know way back about 50 years ago i used to say it's going to be in my lifetime no, 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 no. It's going to be in maybe my grand 
children, a child. I don't have one now. And maybe in my great, great grandkids, but we all are going to get it. And the other thing I want to say is that we are fighting for the freedom for all oppressed peoples. Not people, but peoples. You know, that's how our folks would say it, peoples. We, uh, that's what all of us are going to get it. And it was because of the civil rights movement. I was, I was able to see the connections between all oppressed people of the world in this country all over. Now that's all I have to say. But it was, it, it taught me a lot. And I only <laughs> want to say was that while I was there, I knew I was going to continue. I knew I was going, I was going to uh, stop doing this. I saw it slow down a little bit, but as long as you got a mouth, you can always teach. And don't forget to pass the word to the little bitty babies. Not the babies, but all the babies. And that's how we going to get to do because we have to educate every child that we see, period. Uh, yeah. You know that I do this Atlas Atlas thing. <laughs> <laughs> y'all, I want you all Woo! to go. She first of all, she just mic dropped the whole season in like her her monologue, because that's what Jean does. But I want you all to understand that this is November of 1961. At this point, Jean had already been on a freedom ride. She was one of two women, only two, who were on her freedom ride, along with Reverend C.T. Vivian, Reverend James Lawson. They were on her freedom ride with her. It was the first one that successfully made it to its destination without there being anyone beaten or anything like that. The bus had been burned in Aniston. People had been beat up in Birmingham. And she may did that in addition to integrating many of the facilities that a lot of you who have gone to New Orleans and have gone and had a really good time and were able to go and visit and be around, her and her sisters were part of a group of people who integrated New Orleans. All of that was taking place before they even got to this point where they were threatened with lynching just two years after Mac Parker was killed. And you might be thinking, well, this is loose. No, this isn't a loose tie. Sometimes when you're looking at the history of our ancestors, it may not be that you find the color or the texture of the story through a newspaper account or through a census or something else. Sometimes you have to go directly to people who were around the locations at the time at which things took place in order for you to really understand what was going on. And that's the reason why I brought her on. And and Karen Royal in the chat room is asking, she, is she talking about Aretha? She's asking about Jerome and Aretha and everybody. So you can't see that, Jean, and I'm I'm telling yeah. her that. Um, but I, I I I there was no way that I could do research on Mac and I couldn't have Alice's voice and I couldn't have your voice. So I have a few follow-up questions because one of the things that that I heard during the interview that I went back and listened to was that you guys actually had to leave them there. You couldn't stay. Nope. That was that was part of the whole uh, thing. Someone had to report back to the uh, chapter who in turn reported to National Corps in New York. And that was the other reason why. Uh, you, we left the sports person. So she was supposed to make sure that what was going on to got all the information and then she came back. But I have to say one thing, when Dorotha and I got back to New Orleans, Dorotha started talking and she could not express what was going on. That's just how terrified we were. And I was saying to myself, oh, I can, I, I would be able to tell them what was going on. I went to open up my mouth for the first time it ever happened. Nothing came out. <laughs> That's how traumatized we were. But you are going shaking your head, but these are the things that had to be done in order for us to be where we are now. A lot of people went through the same kind of things. You would do it, but you know you have to make sure that you are, let's see, 
strong enough, uh, poised enough, and not to show any fear at that time, because it's kind of hard to be strong, but that's what you do. That's that's what we had to do at the time. Did you just go across your uh, your your adrenaline, your whole body? It it will do what it has to do, and that's what we did. We were just, I guess, a tool that the creator had to use in order for things to happen. Otherwise, if we didn't do that, I don't know if we have we would have gotten as far as we did. Ooh. And I know a lot of people would say that, oh, I wouldn't have done that. So, but somebody had to do it. And then the ones who were chosen, I'm not saying that we were special or anything, because, you know, I put on my pants the same way everybody else does. But still, I was just not unusual, but I was one of the people who were chosen, along with my sisters. But there were a lot of other people who were chosen who decided, okay, I'm here. I would do it. What? I, I as many times as I've sat here and listened to you, I've never cried. <laughs> and I'm sorry, y'all. I'm laughing because this is our family, and, and I grew up hearing this. But and I, the fact that it probably sounds so preposterous to everyone that I'm listening to this and I'm just I'm crying. But this was such a part of my like, like learning the sky is blue. For my family, knowing this and knowing these stories is is a part of our lives. But hearing the fact that you guys couldn't even say anything, and that well, you we can, and that, it against the uh, philosophy, yeah, but that you can verbalize it now. That just well, I, I just want to today if uh, my my uh, parents' kids were part of uh, the movement. And I was the shortest, and I was five feet at the time. Alice must have been five two. Shirley must have been five three. And we all weighed from about ninety. Maybe Alice must have weighed about eighty five, eighty five to one hundred and two pounds. <laughs> so we were skinny, but didn't know it. <laughs> we know we were fly. <laughs> <laughs> But the other thing is that we had fun. This was in the 60s so we party hardy. That's one of the that's the best part of the stories, you all, is when they tell me about when they went out juking afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> they went out to the club afterwards. So I guess I guess my last question for you is. I mean, you talked about how impactful this experience is. I definitely have to talk to Miss Doty about it at some point. Maybe I'll call her tomorrow and ask her. Um, but how how did that experience change things for you all and your activities after this? Like, did you did did you just kick up things like because you had this shadow of his death there, and then your sister was there. She was there for days, and then you guys had to go back. I know the chapter went back to support. You know. Um, uh, everyone, you know, in terms of their trials, but what? It, how did you all react as a result of this? Like, did you, did you just oh, go we further? We continue. We, uh, Alice and Shirley, I think they went on several uh, testings. They went to Trolley, uh, Louisiana, and I think when they uh, got to Trolley, they were mess, uh, met by a, uh, a, a mob. And I think the police told him to, you can get correction from uh, Doty. I think the uh, uh, the um, police told uh, told him to turn around or something or something, and they came back. But when Alice and Doty, uh, Jerome and Tom Valentine, and I think a couple other people, they went to. Uh, uh, not Papa what, Mo Macomb. M Macomb. I knew it was M word. <laughs> <laughs> it went to Macomb, and that's where they were. They got into the uh, the, the uh, depot, sat down, and it was quiet. Didn't see anybody. And then they said the next thing they knew, the doors just flew open, and there was a mob coming in, and they came in, picked up Tom Valentine, and 
threw him over the counter. And with George Raymond, he was just dancing on the on, on the counter. Then they were trying to catch him. And the mob got a hold of Alice and uh, Doty. And then I think Jerome Smith uh, covered them up. And they just beat poor, uh, I shouldn't say poor, but they beat Jerome Smith a lot. And I don't know how they all got out of there. But this is not funny, but when Doty tells it, they got somehow she got out and she said, I wrote it. her legs say run. <laughs> See, we still can laugh about these things. But while it was happening, their lives were at risk and Doty was running and she said, she heard somebody say, Doty, get in. She said, no one, I, I didn't know a soul in this place and I was getting in and the, the uh, car finally caught up with her and it was one of her colleagues, someone from our core, I think it was uh, Jerome and somebody else. And that's how they uh, got into um, the truck and Jerome gave Doty a number and he said, uh, when they got some call, call this number, and it is the office of uh, the attorney general. She called the uh, that number, and it happens to be Robert Kennedy, and that's what he he uh, answered. Hello, I was expecting your call. This is the attorney general of the United States. So they had FBI's in uh number in macomb by the end of the day and they those people who were uh mobbed came back to new orleans and we had a meeting and they decided they were going to go back the next day and i was one of them there was no way that they were going to tell us dictate to us the what we were going to do that's on our we are the one to to uh determine that nobody else so we were there the next day and nothing happened but we did go the next day they, they weren't going to be in charge of our movement this was our movement not theirs so stuff like that people uh would uh do regardless of what the outspect was supposed to be because if we wanted any type of change, we had to do it on our own. Ooh, panel, do y'all have any questions for Jean? I talk to her every day. <laughs> wow, wow. Thank you. We've been blessed so with your with your story that we just we, let the church say amen. 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 Wow. Yes. Wow. <laughs> no, it's supposed to say man. It, it, well, hey, <laughs> it was babies, okay. <laughs> Alex, Alex, you were you you were gonna you look like you were gonna say something. You know, I'm a, I think that I'm just gonna leave it at my thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We celebrate Veterans Day and Memorial Day often, but when I celebrate it. I celebrate people like you and the work you've done, the movements that you've led, and the just the shoulders that I get to stand on that are so, so strong. Yours. Thank you so much. I have no questions. You Thank from you. New Orleans, yes? My family is. I was raised here in the Bay Area, though. Where? So I was raised in Oakland. My family is from Uptown, Aretha Castle, Haley Boulevard, and to, oh. be, to be back when it was dry and so to, I to know be dry. <laughs> do you remember the do drop in? Oh my See, I don't, I don't know about a do drop in now. You can tell me though. <laughs> also, oh my god. Also, I'm the I'm the nephew of an of an amazing man who is in the who is in attendance tonight named Reginald Harris that knows um all of you. He was an alum at Dillard University while most of this was going on. So if that name rings a bell. It does, but I haven't seen him in and I'm not, yeah, I'm 77 now. 
<laughs> he is he is he is 80 81 next month but he yeah. uh, has been yeah. texting me all night saying say saying that this is incredible so thank you so much on behalf yeah. of my family and myself and, and young leaders today we we really honestly thank you well we we respect you because you guys have to carry it on i can sit back now <laughs> <laughs> We still need you. <laughs> Believe we that. Do, we do. People, people in the chat room, are like, is she working on a book? Blah blah blah. <laughs> we got a project working on, y'all. FYI, which is one of the reasons why my time has to be apportioned a little bit differently next year is because I, I've been, I was crowned the official storyteller of the New Orleans core story, and that is a very, it's a very big task to to manage. Um, but. I'm going to do it. I have to, um, because I don't want anyone else passing away um, before the story. You're getting up in age, honey. Yeah, y'all try, <laughs> trying to be sanitarians and whatnot. I'm just not, I'm not prepared for this. Not at all. But thank you so much, Jean. I feel like we, people are like, can she come on, on permanently? Folks in the chat room are asking for Jean to come in. Uh, they want her just to come and wrap everything up. And they do not believe that you are 77. That That's just, yeah. No, they, I'm not 77. I'm 77. <laughs> <laughs> yes you are yes you are all right well just to uh for those of you who are interested i put the link in the chat room there's a whole section of our atlas family website that is dedicated to Jean and her sister that talks about their involvement in the movement they were there during freedom summer in fact one of my favorite things to say about Jean is that she sat in a room with martin luther king jr and told him pretty much that he was a punk no. <laughs> she didn't say she didn't say it like that but she, but when they were trying to figure out if they were going to continue the freedom rides, one of the things that they said was, you know, he was discouraging them from doing it. And they were like, well, why not? Why not? Why don't you join us? And if and if you if you don't who you think you are, the Lord, they that was his nickname was the Lord. Um, and I did not know this until she told me that. So you got to be kind of bad, kind of badass to say that about we, uh, how old. <laughs> You guys were young and and definitely um, like, you no know, eighteen and something. Yes, yes, but you guys didn't. You didn't care. You were going to challenge no matter what. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you, Jane. I'm so glad I got to share you. And I don't like sharing with other people, but I got to share you tonight. So, you all, we still have another episode left. We still have three more cases to focus on next week. So with episode 83B, it's going to feature three more cases that we worked on documenting the victims um, of lynchings in the United States. And you do not want to miss this. Um, part two is just as impactful as part one. In fact, it may even be a little bit more of a tearjerker. So make sure that you join us next Tuesday, April 30th at 6 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern for stories from the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, part two. Also, be sure to tune into the long-running research at the National Archives and Beyond, hosted by Black Progen Life panelist Bernice Bennett. On Thursday, April 25th, Bernice is going to be talking to Black Progen Life panelist Angela walter Margie about Freedmen of the Frontier. This book represents or presents multiple stories from a 52 family project documenting Freedmen of the of fa yeah. Freedmen families of Indian Territory. They were people who were once enslaved by the five civilized tribes and who were living in what is now Oklahoma between 1866 and 19. 1907, the year of Oklahoma statehood, they and their children were referred to as freedmen of the five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw Creek, and Seminole nations. The purpose of this undertaking was to bring to light the presence of Indian tribal freedmen and the rich legacy that mm -hmm. they left upon Oklahoma soil. The freedmen are among the most understudied and underrepresented in American history. Studies focusing on reconstruction after the Civil War never mentioned the adjustments that freedmen from the five civilized, from the five slaveholding tribes endured. The freedmen from these five nations face their new life of freedom without the benefits of education and guaranteed paid labor, and some sought assistance from the Freedmen's Bureau. These families would not receive American citizenship until 1907, when Oklahoma became a state. However, more than 20,000 freedmen lived incredible lives on the frontier, contributing to their nations and becoming a part of American historical landscape. Visit 
blogtalkradio.com forward slash Bernice Bennett for more information. Also, check out the African Roots podcast hosted by Black Virgin Life panelist Angela Walter Raji. She recently celebrated 10 years of the podcast with episode 440. Visit africanrootspodcast.com for more. And I'm going to turn it over to you, True, for you to give your salutation on video. <laughs> um, girl, it was I, a show. Yeah. So... Did you, were you going to do like our regular yeah. outro? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just go ahead and sign us on out. Cause we all spent tonight. <laughs> yeah. So we just want to thank you all. And don't forget, like Nika said, to come on out for the um, second episode 83 B on April the 30th. And we just wanted to honor Dr. David Augustine E. Johnston, Dr. Lewis Harrison Johnston, Mr. Alan Gibson Johnston, Corporal Leroy A. Johnston, Mr. Matt Charles Parker, and Ms. Della McDuffie. We speak your names. We speak your names. Good night, everyone. <laughs>